Good afternoon. Welcome to Summa Health Facebook Live. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Dr. David Custodio, and I'm the president of the Akron City and St. Thomas campuses here at Summa Health. And I'm very proud to be here today with Dr. Thomas File. Tom is the chair of our Summa Health Infectious Disease Division here. Not only is he famous locally, he also leads across the nation as president of the Infectious Disease Society of America, which includes more than 12,000 infectious disease physicians, scientists, public health experts. He is an advisor to healthcare providers and policymakers across the nation during this pandemic. You may ask, why are we doing this today? I think it's very important to have a good source of information for the public around questions they may have about COVID-19. We think it's important that the community is prepared and understands the virus. First, we wanna say thank you for the community staying at home. So if, if you're at home watching this virtual high five, we really appreciate it. Help us flatten the curve and uh, we really appreciate all that you're doing. We've already seen, according to the modeling, that our social distancing and our efforts here have begun to flatten that curve. So you stay at home and we'll stay at the hospital taking care of the patients. We really appreciate that. And speaking of that, I wanna thank healthcare workers here at SUMA, in the region, our state, our country, and all over the world who are out there on the front line providing care for our patients that require it. And at that time, let's uh, go ahead and start taking some questions. First up, Barb asks, how worried should I be about COVID-19? Dr. Fowle. Well, Dave, uh, we we'll certainly need to be concerned about it, but as far as how worried you should be, Barb, it's gonna depend upon certain factors. I mean, if you're young and if you're healthy, we know that you still can get this infection, uh, but you're less likely to have serious uh, complications. Uh, however, having said that, I, I personally uh, have been in contact with some 20-year-olds 20 20 -year who have had this, have not had to come in the hospital, but have really felt quite bad. They said it's the worst they've ever felt as far as any influenza. On the other hand, uh, if you're older, uh, probably over the age of 65, if you have underlying conditions, and those underlying conditions primarily are uh, heart disease, lung disease, uh, obesity, uh, and diabetes, uh, then you're at higher risk for having complications, having pneumonia uh, that might require you uh, to come into the hospital. But let me say this, and David's already mentioned that, there's a way that you can reduce that worry, that you can reduce that concern, and that is, you know, um, follow the good practices that uh, David mentioned. That is, stay at home, uh, social distancing, so that if you're in home and you're around people, try to stay six feet away, and wash your hands. This is very important. Wash your hands and try to avoid touching your face. If you do all that, the worry should be less. Great. Thanks, Tom. Laura is asking, if someone is sick and is quarantined, do bed sheets, clothing, and the like need to be washed daily, Dr. Pop? Well, that would be good. Uh, we do know that uh, if you are sick and you're shedding this virus, this virus can land on uh, surfaces and including uh, sheets, uh, although we don't know exactly how long they would be there. But the CDC does recommend that we should either disinfect or wash these uh, items uh, frequently, and certainly daily would be great. I mean, it also includes uh, uh, sanitizing uh, surfaces uh, like uh, desktops or doorknobs, even the phones that are gonna be highly used or touched by different people, we should probably sanitize these at least daily. And you can use just regular household disinfectant, or even soap and water uh, is very effective. Great, thank you. Um, another viewer is asking, Sandra says, if I need to go to the store, should I wear a mask? That's a very good question, and that's a very <laughs> hot topic right now. Uh, you may have seen that in the media, certain hot spots or areas like New York, uh, the local health departments are recommending that when people go out that they should wear some type of barrier, uh, maybe a, a handmade mask or even a bandana. We're certainly not recommending that you wear the types of surgical masks that we need in the hospital because we need those to protect our healthcare workforce as we take care of patients. But the rationale for that is, is what we're becoming aware that a large segment of the people that are infected actually don't have any symptoms. And they potentially could be shedding uh, the virus even as you're, as you're talking like I am right now. And so by wearing some type of protective barrier, like even a, a homemade mask or a bandana, you potentially are reducing the amount of virus that could be shed from you to somebody else. So by going out into the store and wearing a mask, you're helping 
prevent transmission from potentially you to others. And that's going to help reduce this uh, curve or flatten the curve that David talked about. Yes, and Tom, if I may ask, you know, the mask is great while you're out there, but it really is to keep you from shedding virus. Right. But it doesn't make you a superhero or immune, right? So if you're out at the grocery store, you should be avoiding touching your face and all those things. It's still important that you practice that. Yeah, absolutely. It does not diminish the importance of social distancing. That's still the most important aspect that you can do to prevent this. Thanks, Tom. Christine is asking, you know, there's a lot of talk about proteins and virus. She wants to know, is it actually a virus or is it a protein that she's reading on the internet? No, this is actually a virus. I mean, this is a virus. Uh, the coronavirus is actually a large family of viruses, uh, mostly in animals, quite honestly. But we've seen this where some of these uh, viruses can mutate, they change, they can evolve to be able to uh, infect humans. They often go through an intermediate uh, type of host, like some uh, mammal. But this has happened before. We've seen this with SARS that many of our uh, viewers probably are aware of, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but I also want to make sure you're aware that, you know, there are a variety of <coughs> coronaviruses that always have been circulating in the community. Uh, we call these endemic or just normal uh, uh, coronaviruses. And they cause <coughs> usually mild infections like the common cold. Obviously, the difference here is, is that this is a much more serious infection Nobody is uh, immune to it because it is a novel uh, virus. Uh, so that's why uh, we're so concerned about it. And it certainly it can cause serious infection like we've heard about. Great. Thank you, Tom. Dorothy's asking about what plans are there to assist and protect midwives, pregnant women, and babies during this time? Well, that's a very good question. And when we have mothers who potentially are infected or documented to be infected, you know, after the delivery, we're going to separate the baby from the mother for a while. That's very important. We don't want the babies uh, to be in infected. So we do have policies in place uh, for uh, pregnant women uh, as they're being evaluated and through delivery process. Correct. And Ian, great question. And keep in mind that those same protections that we put in place on the regular medical surgical floors for our healthcare workers and providers will be implemented on those labor and delivery floors as well. So thank you. Another question, is it more important to wear gloves or a mask when going out? Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, uh, it would be a mask, I mean, because we know primarily this is spread by what we call droplet form. And that means uh, when particularly you cough or you sneeze, you liberate these little droplets and the viruses within them. Those droplets can go out about five or six feet. So that's why you've all heard about the six feet rule. Uh, so that's probably more important. But we do know that, you know, when you cough or you sneeze, you can cough it into your hands and have it on your hands as well. But if you're wearing gloves, unless you change your gloves every time, it's not going to matter. Or, what, what's more important is to wash your hands or, or to use the uh, hand sanitizers very frequently because that will get rid of the uh, virus uh, uh, if you do that. Great. This one's hot off the presses. There it is. Tracy's asking, should I wash and disinfect groceries when I bring them home? Well, you really don't have to uh, do any extra washing with your groceries. I mean, with vegetables and fruits, it's always good to wash them when you get home uh, for bacterial infections uh, as well. Uh, but unless a lot of people are handling them and touching them, they, they shouldn't not be a high risk for uh, acquiring um, the COVID virus from that way. Great. We have a viewer, Christine is asking, if I have symptoms, where do I call? Well, that's a good question. We do have here at Zoom a hotline, a COVID hotline that you can call and access. You can get a, a virtual a screening as to what your symptoms are. I mean, if it is consistent with COVID, then you can be directed to a, another line where they uh, can be uh, more specific in, in asking uh, questions. Um, most patients actually who have uh, this infection can be treated just over the phone and at, and at home. We don't want you necessarily, if you're not all that ill, to come to the emergency room because that would uh, potentially overload uh, the emergency room. But uh, most patients we can treat symptomatically. However, if you do develop uh, a severe cough or shortness of breath or a fever, then you're probably going to be directed to call your primary care physician. Uh, and there is a protocol we have at Sumer uh, for our uh, our, our primary care physicians for what they should do with these types of patients to where, where they should go to be further evaluated. 
Okay. Here's a, another question. Randy's asking, what have we learned from doctors in other areas of the world that are ahead of us in this pandemic? Well, one thing we've learned is the importance of what we've talked about, and that's social distancing. I mean, the areas in the world that did this very quickly and very stringently uh, with high compliance, they're not having as much problem. Uh, but if we look at uh, countries like Italy, where they didn't do it the, as rapidly or as quickly as possible, you can see the, the consequences. So it's extremely important from that. We've also learned uh, from our colleagues in other countries where, particularly, let's say, China, where this uh, originated, of, of some of the benefits of some of the medicines that can be used. I mean, we really don't have proven therapeutics right now, but you've probably all heard about certain medications that we're using in our patients that do seem to be promising. They are undergoing a randomized clinical trials to make sure, uh, but most of us have protocols in place particularly for patients that are sick enough to come in the hospital, uh, that we may use these types of medicines that um, have been evaluated elsewhere. Great. And we continue to learn there's a significant amount of collaboration across the country and across the world with those specialists to try and help those of us who are ramping up for it versus those who are uh, on the tailwind. That so. is true. That is true. Very good. We have a question from Laura that asks, if you work at the hospital but work outside, what precautions can be taken to protect yourself from the folks going in and out? Well, actually, we're uh, screening everybody coming into the hospital, whether you're an employee or a visitor. Of course, we're now restricting uh, visitors, but if you're a vendor and need to come into the hospital, everybody is going to be uh, screened to make sure they don't have fever or symptoms. Uh, and that way, that is going to help preventing the possibility of infection coming from outside into, our, into the hospital. Obviously, this is live, and Dr. File's working. Someone's going to need his page there. <laughs> yeah, I'll so. have to look at it. But. <laughs> uh, Tracy's asking, I don't have a thermometer. How can I know if I have a fever? Well, you probably have some um, awareness if you feel feverish. I mean, if, if you feel hot for warm, you can touch your forehead. Does it feel hotter than normal? Are you sweating? Uh, do you have chills? Uh, those would be the types of uh, manifestations uh, that would occur if you actually had fever. But not every fever, Tom, would require someone to come in and get seen. You right. know, it would prompt perhaps a call or a virtual visit that you discussed. Right. But it doesn't mean uh, you immediately need to go seek uh, attention at a healthcare right. facility or at the doctor's office. Certainly call and ask and right. check. But uh, yeah, and, and remember, 80% of the people that get this infection have mild manifestations and certainly don't have to come to the hospital, certainly don't have to come to the emergency room. And we, can be, we feel very comfortable just treating over the phone uh, with the symptoms uh, that you have, but you can take uh, acetaminophen for a fever or you know, some discomfort or other. Uh, that low amount can actually uh, transmit the infection. Uh, from a cardboard, similarly, it was 24 hours, but over about two or three hours, the amount dropped very quickly. Um, and I say this um, because it is important uh, that uh, you know, we disinfect certain surfaces that might have high contact of a variety of people touching them, uh, like doorknobs or uh, keypads of uh, computers. I mean, these probably should be disinfected uh, af after each uh, use so that the next person coming uh, can uh, reduce acquiring them from that. But again, if we all use, we wash our hands and use hand sanitizers after we touch these, that should reduce that transmission as well. Great. Well, we've got uh, a couple rolling in. Here's one. Can you bash some of the COVID-19 myths? For example, can I kill a virus by blowing a hair dryer into my face or gargling with salt water? Or is it both, Tom? <laughs> Well, if you, I mean, first of all, if you didn't mind burning your face, I mean, you, you'd have to use your uh, hair dryer because it takes about 30 minutes at a high heat to be able to kill it. And th that's going to cause a significant burn on your face. So that's not going to be practical at all. And gargling in salt water is, is not necessarily going to, um, to prevent it. I think the most common uh, myths that uh, have been sent to me are, number one, this is just uh, another flu, and why should be uh, this? You know, we're overreacting, and that's not true. This is not just another flu. Remember, this is a new, novel 
uh, infection and we're all susceptible to it and it cause, can cause very serious disease and the mortality rate is about 10 times higher than with flu. Uh, so it is important. This is not just overreacting to a flu-like illness. Secondly, the other myth uh, that I commonly uh, hear is, well, I'm young, it doesn't, it's not going to bother me. Uh, but it can, and, and we've certainly seen very serious disease, albeit not as common as in the older patient or the one with, uh, or, or those with uh, underlying conditions. But unfortunately, we've seen even, even some deaths in some young, healthy people, so that can happen. Plus, young, healthy people can give it to the older people, and that's extremely important. You need to be responsible if you're young and healthy and follow these social distancing policies just as much as anybody else because you are the one potentially who are spreading it within the community if you don't follow those uh, policies. Can't emphasize that enough. Just because you uh, are young and healthy, you may transmit that to your loved ones or others yeah. and, and uh, we need to avoid that at all costs. So to recap, no hair dryers, no salt water gargling. <laughs> Wash your hands, maintain yeah, your distance, yeah. and uh, follow the social policies. Here's a question from Randy. Uh, what's your opinion about hydroxychloroquine as a potential cure for this uh, viral? Well, I think the question is well stated because it's a potential cure. I mean, and you've all heard about it in the media. Uh, and it, it sort of goes back to what I said earlier. This is a type of medicine that's been used in China and they found that sort of anecdotally in sort of observational evaluation that it seemed to provide benefit. But we don't really have a proven uh, evaluation uh, of this drug until we have randomized clinical trials that really shows the true benefit that it's safe and effective. And there are multiple studies undergoing right now that will truly be able to tell us. Having said that, I mean, I think most of us uh, in institutions across the country are using this drug for the more seriously ill patients, uh, but we're always using it on a case-by-case -case basis. I mean, we always have to consider the benefits and the risks of the drug. This drug is not without side effects, and there are contraindications, and I would say about a third of the patients that we've even considered putting it on, there's been significant contraindications, and mainly it's uh, conditions of the heart that are, are of concern whether we should use this drug or, or not. But I think clinical trials uh, will definitely show the benefit. And of course, you've probably also heard of combining this with the common antibiotic azithromycin. But here again, we need the clinical trials to really show that this truly is a uh, uh, proven benefit. So more to come on that. Yep. Very good. Uh, we have a question uh, from Crystal. When should we expect the surge to occur in the emergency departments? Well, as you know, David, I mean, we've been following this uh, yep. in our incident command center, I mean, because we're trying to prepare for the need for increased uh, devices and ventilators and protective equipment, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the model that we've been following uh, looks like it's going to be towards the end of this month. Yep. Uh, and uh, so we're just on the sort of the upslope, and it's a gradual upslope right now. I mean, we just started seeing patients about two weeks ago, and we're seeing you know, patients come in daily, but we're not seeing a big surge. And we hope that that surge is really blunted, uh, and it's really going to be help to be blunted if everybody follows this uh, social uh, distancing. But we're uh, pr we're anticipating that pr that our and, um, peak will be around the end of this uh, this month. So we still have some time here. Yeah, it'll ramp up before then peak at the end of the month and. Uh uh, we've been following the models that the folks at Ohio Department of Health have been uh, utilizing. I can't stress enough how important it is that if we can blunt that upslope, as we're yeah. talking about, we can help mitigate the risks of overwhelming our healthcare system. We're yeah. doing all that we can to prepare for that, and as Dr. Rafael alluded to, we are spending time every day planning uh, to create the space, to create the staff, and uh, address those. Uh, 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 space concerns, and we know that there's going to be a big surge and a, a need for a lot of hospital beds and ICU beds. So that's what we've been doing on a regular basis to prepare, as well as the mm -hmm. supplies that you've been hearing a lot. Someone's asking, Sandra, I believe it is, is it true that antibodies from the plasma mm -hmm. from those who have recovered is being developed into a vaccine? Well, Sandra, there's actually two aspects there. I mean, you're probably aware that people have used convalescent plasma. That is, we take blood from patients who have recovered from the virus, and then you can uh, 
administered it to patients who are ill with it, and that does help because that then provides antibodies to those patients that are already developed from patients who are, are, have already convalesced from it, and that's been shown to be beneficial. And you're probably aware that th this is starting to be used in patients even in this country. That's not what is used for vaccines, though. Vaccines, what we, uh, where it's being ev evaluated is you take part of the virus, a genetic part of the virus, and actually um, comprise a vaccine, uh, and, uh, and that part of the virus will induce an immune system. You're not actually giving the whole virus. You're just giving part of the uh, sequence of, of the virus. That induces, however, an antibody to that part, which is protective as well. Uh, so that's two different concepts. So using convalescent plasma is one, and then the other is the vaccine. Now that vaccine, as you know, is going through clinical trials right now, but that takes a while to make sure that it's going to be safe uh, and effective. And as we've heard, that's at least uh, 12 to 18 months away before we'll have it for the general public. So we'll hope that our treatments uh, develop and then the yeah. vaccine develops. So right. a related question to that one. Once infected, are people immune, Dr. File? Well, we think that is the case. I mean, this is certainly the case for other uh, respiratory infections. We don't know for sure, but I mean, that's the premise of using the convalescent the plasma, that when you give the antibodies, which is the immune response uh, to patients that are affected, that it will be beneficial, and on basis of uh, small studies that has been shown to be true. In addition, there are animal studies that have shown uh, that if you infect animals, they do develop an antibody, and then if you try to infect them again, they, are, they won't be infected. So I think there is evidence that there will be immunity after infection, and that's going to be important because when a certain percentage of the population are infected, this is a concept called herd immunity, and that means it's going to reduce the spread within a community because a certain percent won't get it because they are already immune. Great. We'll change the subject a little bit. Becky's asking, how is it that the predictions for the U.S. death toll could reach over 100,000 when China had less than 4,000? Well, that's, uh, that's a good question. And number one, I'm not sure we actually know the true numbers from uh, China. Um, but again, these are based on mathematical models. Uh, and we're hoping that by blunting that, uh, that, that will reduce uh, that number. But this, and even the president said this is a sobering uh, information that I think we have to be realistic about this. And, uh, and if we do do social um, you know, policies to reduce uh, transmission, hopefully it will be much less than that. Speaking of transmission, there's a question out there. Sue is asking, will there be a second wave of the infection in the fall? Well, this probably will be like other um, respiratory viruses that in the fall they tend to come back. And uh, like I said, we do have these other coronaviruses, these endemic uh, coronaviruses that are circulating in the, in the um, usually in the winter months and they call, cause the common cold. I would not be surprised that we would see that. Uh, however, in the fall, I, we're certainly not going to see this big concern that we see now because, as I've already mentioned, there's probably going to be a certain segment of the population that, that will be infected during this stage of the infection, so they're going to be potentially uh, immune to it. And I think, uh, you know, we're going to have awareness of these antiviral medicines right. that will be proven one way or the other, and then shortly, hopefully, uh, after the winter months uh, next year, we'll have a, a vaccine available. Great. Well, we're running out of time. We have uh, a question here. How do you think this virus will change the way we live and work when the pandemic is over? Yeah, that's a good question because everybody wants to get back to business as usual, right? So I think uh, we're probably not going to get back to truly business as usual. I think this is going to teach us that we still have to uh, follow these good health practices uh, to reduce spread of infection from person to person. And again, you know, if you're sick, stay home. Uh, practice uh, social distancing. Hand washing is going to be, I think, something that's going to be ingrained into our population that we need to continue to do to reduce infection spread of any type of virus or even bacteria from person to person. Hopefully some of these lessons learned will be better even when it's regular flu again, right? Absolutely, Tom? absolutely. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate you taking time to join us here at Zuma Health's Facebook Live. I can't thank you enough for your time. Uh, great questions today. 
Remember, it's still important that we practice social distancing, wash your hands, don't touch your face. If you're sick, stay at home. Uh, so I want you all to be safe. Stay home, like I said, so we can stay here and work for you. And thank you so much.